Hello and welcome to Breaking the Cycle. My name is Alan Hyde and I will be your guide into the world of mental health, recovery, and spirituality. I'm joined tonight by our talented producer, Gabe. Gabe, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing well, man. How are you? Good, good. It's good to see you. Same to you, man. Uh, Same to you. Yeah. Well, uh, if you guys tuned in last week, we had a, a pretty good and productive conversation last week, huh, Gabe? We did. It was yeah. a heavy one, but it was a good one. Yeah, you know, I got some feedback on it during the week, and, uh, you know, a lot of people were just glad to see, you mm-hmm. know, two dudes from different backgrounds having a meaningful conversation. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, yeah. I mean... I don't think I've ever had a conversation like that with somebody else that didn't have a similar experience to me. So yeah. it's cool to do that, yeah. um, especially doing it live. So absolutely, it was fun. tonight I, I don't know how you know heavy it'll be, but I think tonight we're going to talk a little bit about perfectionism okay. and get some different perspectives on it. And yeah. Is that something you've uh, experienced ever or seen? Uh, yes, it's definitely something that I've experienced in operating <laughs> from time to time. I feel like. Um, I'm naturally an overthinker. Mm. Um, and so there's a lot of things that like I want to accomplish and I want I want to do, but I think my way out of it. It's like, okay, I don't have all of my ducks in a row right now. Yeah. Um, and I think that just comes from a place of wanting things to look right and wanting it to be right. I want mm. it to like feel how it's supposed to feel. But even when you get to a certain level, it yeah. may not feel how you thought it was going to feel. <laughs> right. So I'm trying to, I'm working my way out of that perfectionist mindset so yeah you know it's it's important too that you mention you know just if if we're going to talk about kind of like the mental health side of it like Mm -hmm. when it gets really severe you mentioned overthinking Mm -hmm. right and uh if if you were to look up or google or look in webster's or look in the diagnostic Mm -hmm. criteria for perfectionism Mm -hmm. it's a set of traits that are one related to like obsessive compulsive type thoughts and behaviors but it's it's characterized by high expectations Mm -hmm. and unrealistic standards Mm -hmm. right and and i think as you were kind of just touching on sometimes the experiences that pull you in Mm -hmm. i can absolutely relate to that where it's like you know when i look at my life it's like you know i've got a decent place where i live i've got a pup that's super cute that i enjoy (laughs) spending time with you know i enjoy my career but then there's still those moments where i get the thought process of like but I want it to be better, right. you know? Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's just, I don't know. I think when you are a person who does have ambition, mm. um, I feel like a lot of ambitious people struggle with that, mm. um, with the uh, the need to always strive for more. Mm. Um, and while that's a great trait to have, I do feel like it does come with its disadvantages at times too because, yeah. like, you're never really satisfied. Like, right. And, I, don't, I mean... Not to get off on a tangent, but I do feel like satisfaction isn't necessarily found in the things that we think is found. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, you know, it's. Um, I was talking with my therapist about this precisely, you know, yesterday actually, and part of the conversation is when when that comes up, it's always an internal job, right? right. There is no outward solution. And I found that a lot in my like even my recovery pursuits. You know, it's like. Every outside, you know, uh, accomplishment I ever pursued or any outside effect that I sought to change my experience was Mm. never the solution. It was only when I was willing to look at my shortcomings. It was only when I was willing to look at my disconnection from my higher power. Mm. It was only when I was willing to look at like what decisions that I was making um, that led me to overthink the situations and then behave in ways that weren't in line with my morals and values. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just it. Like (laughs) you, you get into these zones and these spaces where like you feel that, um, sometimes your ambition overtakes another part of you, I guess. And when you brought up more of your morals and some of that, like, I just think about celebrities, right. Mm. And all of the stuff that they're willing to sacrifice to get to a certain level. But then in that level, like us who aren't on a celebrity level, we look at that, oh, that's the perfect life. That's the mm-hmm. that's the goal. That's the dream. And right. it's like, in actuality, you may get it and be completely miserable. Yeah. As most, we've seen most so many are. times. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I think satisfaction and that peace is not found in things. And mm-hmm. it's not found in a title. Right. Um, it's, it's found in you operating within the purpose that God gave you. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. depending on what you believe. Yeah, you know, it's like... Um, I was just working with someone today. She's a young Harvard educated lawyer. 
you know, makes pretty much close to half a mil a year, wow. you know, with upward movement still because she's early in her career. Yeah. And a lot of the work that we do is really just chilling her out to take a look at how good her life is right now. <laughs> you know, the things are yeah. pretty good, man. Yeah. And, uh, and my heart goes out to her and, and individuals like that because, mm-hmm. you know, even the conversation you and I are having, because we identify it mm-hmm. with that as people is like, I, I've got it good, but I want it to be better. Yeah. You know? And I think, I think a lot of that is like, we lose sight of even the pieces of the conversation you and I had last mm-hmm. week where it's like, look, man, some people have it real bad, Yeah, you know? And, um, staying in touch with that is super important. Yeah. It, it was an impactful, you know, conversation for me last week too, just from the standpoint of like, you know, I don't always stop to think that like, oh yeah, that's right. People have way different experiences than I do. Yeah, you know? it's the truth. Like yeah. that conversation last week kind of was a reminder. And I think yeah. that's kind of necessary in the world that we live in today because we don't really have those interactions a lot. Yeah. Um, even just regular conversation like yeah. we don't have a lot of that on a daily basis because we're so locked into our devices and yeah. the things that we have to do on a day-to-day basis so we're not taking that time to have those conversations yeah um, yeah you know and and i remember i i had a conversation years back with one of my best friends from high school who you know is african-american and mm-hmm. we had the the that conversation from the standpoint of i remember i felt and i felt the twinge when we were having the conversation mm-hmm. of like oh fuck i've got to be perfect not to like say some shit I don't mean or say things that could be misconstrued Mm -hmm. and I remember sharing that with him years ago and he had shared with me he was like I felt that same twinge of like I I wanted to perfectly explain my experience right but we both realized like neither of those points really mattered what Mm -hmm. mattered was the connection yeah you know and I do think oftentimes like when when having conversations like that like it's less about being perfect and more so about not wanting to offend. Yeah. Like, because it's a touchy subject. Like, you're talking about people's lived experiences. Yeah. Like, things that are triggering for them or mm-hmm. um, things that may put them in a negative headspace sometimes, at times. You know, mm-hmm. like, it's real life. <laughs> yeah. And so whenever you talk real life, it, it comes with a, like, it just comes with a certain feeling. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. And that twinge is just, like, kind of, like, all right, hold on. No. <laughs> like, it's, just, it's like kind of checking you a little bit. Yeah. So I definitely felt that as well. So. Yeah, you know, and and what what a blessing it is that we can have these conversations and mm-hmm. and talk about not just um, you know differences, but mental health and and different topics that people relate to, right. no matter what our backgrounds are. Yeah. You know, and and to to also hold the the gravity of like there are differences and they're still very real. Yeah. And, and there is no perfect solution. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, you know, if we tie it into kind of some of the concepts we're touching on early in the conversation today, Mm -hmm. I think that's a big problem as to why things don't change in society a lot is that everybody wants it to be a perfect solution, not a real solution. Right. You know? And it isn't a perfect solution. First of all, nothing is perfect. We weren't created to be perfect. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like, we were created with the free will for a reason. Like, we have choice and decision making. And all of our decisions, because we're humans, it's not going to be the perfect decision every single time. Right. Um, and so I think that there's not a real solution to some of these problems, but mm. I think you can just start to heal what was and rebuild new. Yeah. Um, but it starts with acknowledgement, like we were talking about last week. So Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw this thing um, I was reading this week, and it said, you know, therapy is not the process of fixing problems. It's mm-hmm. the process of healing past hurts yeah. so that – the problems can be changed in real time right you know and and i think that's what happens when you have these kind of open Mm -hmm. conversations about life yeah and i think like i i think of the example of like getting cut right Mm. you may get cut somewhere like let's just say it's on your arm you get a cut on your arm you may not bleed anymore but the scar is still there yeah so there's still this it takes time for those scars to heal yeah um and in the sense of what we're talking about, I feel that it's not going to truly heal until we start having conversations like what we had on a mm-hmm. grand scale. Yeah. Um, because that's, it's just, it's a lot embedded mm-hmm. in the culture or the way we live. So, yeah. And you know, you know what I like, and I, I, I would like to hear your opinion on this too. Is like, mm-hmm. 
when that healing starts to take place, because because mm-hmm. there are, you know, we're, we're not the only two having, you know, open yeah. conversations from differences. Right. <clears throat> but I, I think a lot of times when, when we see in, in culture, the conversations, when it goes sideways and people are, are at odds with each other, mm-hmm. it's because they're not accepting that the scar has changed the way that it looks, yeah. you know, it still is healing, mm-hmm. but there's a new, there's a new image, yeah. right? It, it's not going to be what it was mm-hmm. and it's, and it changed, right? It, it, it is now a new form that has to be talked about. Right. You know? Exactly. And it, it shows up in different capacities and different spaces than it once did. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that that same, the foundation of where that scar came from is still in effect. Right. And so I think that's what people miss sometimes is like, mm-hmm. we talk about the conversations that we had, like we talk about it as, as if it was just the 400 years of slavery. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's so much more beyond that, mm. that is still in effect. Like mm. the anti lynching bill, not to get too deep again, but yeah. uh, that just passed like two or three years ago. Right. So it's, there's things that like, again, are embedded in, the fabric of where we live Mm. that, you know, until it's acknowledged and handled and addressed, it's not really going to change. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and for those listening, right. I I think this is important to keep you guys up to speed with what Gabe and I are talking about, why it's Mm. important in a conversation about perfectionism is, you know, I I was just asked a question uh, a moment ago by, you know, by Sammy who runs the studio and she was talking about like mental health when first responders like cops see it on the streets. And she asked a really important question, which, uh, you know, as a clinician, I get all the time is like, what's the solution, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's, it's exactly what you were just saying right now is like, these are multifaceted, multi-layered, long-winded problems that don't yeah. that don't have a surface solution. Mm-hmm. And you, you know, one of the things I shared with her is the conversation like you and I had last mm-hmm. week. It's it's feet on the ground having meaningful conversations and people like you guys who are tuning in listening to them. Mm-hmm. Um, if even there's only one thing you take from the conversation we have and the rest of it, you're like, ah, oh, whatever, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, it's important to start to open the doors to realizing that there is a, a long lineage and history throughout time of people treating each other pretty rotten. Yeah. And we live, I think in, 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 you correct me if I'm wrong here too, like, or just from your perspective, we live in such a, a weird time. Like we're on a precipice of like, things could either get way worse mm-hmm. Or they could get better than they've ever been. Absolutely. And I don't know which way it's going to go. Neither do I. Yeah. I And I wholeheartedly agree with that. I, yeah. I feel that we're in a space that it's, it's a transitional space. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like the next generation that's coming up, the ones behind us, because I guess we're both considered millennials yeah. or whatever. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the rules no more. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the generation that's coming up behind us feels that, like, I'm not taking none of the stuff that my parents took. Mm. I'm not dealing with none of the stuff that America has told me that I'm required to deal with. Yeah. Um, I want to travel before my 30s. Yeah. I want to experience all of these different things. So with that, I think it comes with like a sense of like, I, I want change, I mm-hmm. guess in a sense, I feel like that's what their movement is but yeah. at the same time you still have an older generation that exists that still wants that structure that still wants that same thing that they're used to mm-hmm. um and so with that being said you also have a election year going on yeah. where we don't know what's going to happen yeah. and we know that certain ideas and certain groups of people have certain ideologies that could be detrimental mm-hmm. um so you know you just you never know it's a yeah. lot a lot of pieces to it yeah well yeah and you know especially you know without getting it political or anything it's like we know that even you know if the elections held the power mm-hmm. you know uh things would be different you Absolutely. know but it's it's wherever you you made this point last week too and i, I think it's really important mm-hmm. for for the concept of like when we detach in our individual lives from like the bigger picture yeah. it's like man power goes where the money's at mm-hmm. and and there's not a whole lot that you know, we're going to do feet on the ground to change any of that Mm -hmm. other than to, to detach and take the best care of ourselves that we can. And, uh, you know, someone really wise in my life, I was talking to him last week, uh, you know, plays kind of like a, well, he's, he's a sponsor. He plays a mentorship role in my life. Mm -hmm. And, 
and uh, he had shared, you know, a lot of times when you look around in society today, mm-hmm. and this is coming from a social scientist perspective as well, it's like you see how much the concept of a higher power is needed. Yeah. You know, so many people are wandering around and they don't believe in anything. Mm-hmm. So no wonder people can't have calm conversations about differences without it getting racially charged or people getting pissed off and treating each other like crap because they don't believe in anything. Yeah, and you know? I think for a lot of people, I didn't realize how many people, again, go into different experiences. Like, yeah. I grew up in church. Mm-hmm. I grew up around in, in Christian environments my whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of strayed away from it for a little bit and then came back to it because I feel like that foundation kind of prepared me for what what I can, what I'm able to tolerate now mm-hmm. or what I'm able to deal with and experience now. Um, yeah. Because I feel that without some sort of foundation, like, it's you're going to be wandering. It's like a yeah. chicken with his head cut off. Like, it's you're going to be all over the place. Um, there's no structure. Um, and so, I, granted, I don't press religion on anybody, but yeah. it's more so about just having something to believe in. Like, right. in this world that just looks so dark. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. There's, there's a philosophical truth to it in the sense of, like, when we go through life, especially as we relate to thinking about our mental health, mm-hmm. If, if you're the dictating power, then you're in a real problem when you found yourself in a situation where your best thinking got you in trouble. Right. You know, and, and if that's the place, if, if it was just that, right, for those listening, if it was just that, that sometimes your best thinking gets you in trouble, wouldn't it be a huge relief if there was something else out there that had some better ideas? <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what people don't realize. Like, it, it's not so much about what religion you practice i don't think no like granted i i mean as a christian i do hope that for other people yeah. but i can't force nobody in that direction i just think that it's it's a necessary it's a necessity mm-hmm. <laughs> i can't even talk today uh, it's a necessity for some for you to believe in something like yeah. have something to lean on when you when you don't have nowhere to go yeah when you don't see any options mm-hmm. you know so yeah Without the, without like that foundation of belief and morals and values, and mm-hmm. y- y- you're less likely to take action. We know that empirically in the research, right? It's like in in recovery circles we call it the AAA approach: mm-hmm. awareness, acceptance, action. All right. Yeah. So it's like, imagine you're on the side of the road and your car is crashed. When you get out, it's it's good to have awareness that there is a problem. It's better to have awareness of what the problem is, yeah, right? Exactly. And then once you have that awareness, you can have some acceptance, right? Mm-hmm. And so you come to the next juncture, which is like, okay, it's good to have acceptance that there is a problem, but it's going to be a lot better if you have acceptance of what that problem is, yeah. right? And then once you have the awareness of the problem, acceptance of the problem, you're much more likely to take action. Mm-hmm. If only there in, in our journey of the unseen, right? Mental health and our emotions. If only there were philosophical, spiritual principles that existed that could point us to the right places of awareness, to the right mm-hmm. places of acceptance so that we could take action. If only that existed somewhere. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But it's, you know, I, I think a big thing too is it's messy, mm-hmm. right? It's it like is. in order to to turn your life over in that way, you have to accept that your life is a mess. Mm -hmm. And I I haven't met a ton of people. I've met enough people in my life who are willing to admit that, but I haven't met just hordes of people that are willing to admit that as a human being, my life is a mess. Yeah. You know, I meet far more people whose lives are a mess who will tell you that their life is perfect, Mm -hmm. you know? And I I think that's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, everybody's going to have a point in their life where they hit rock bottom. Whatever that rock bottom looks like, whatever your circumstances are, I feel, for me anyway, Mm -hmm. when I hit rock bottom with financial stuff and life stuff and all of the stuff going on at that time, like, I felt like God was the only thing that I could go to. Mm. Um, And, you know, I I don't know. Everybody's experience is different. Um, but I feel like that's usually what it takes, especially when you when you gone away from it or you never experienced it. I feel like it takes you having those rock bottom moments to really be like, okay, like God, I need you. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. 
Well, let me ask you this, right? Mm -hmm. And and I'm not looking for any kind of specific answer on this, but what do you think it is naturally about a conversation regarding perfectionism that brings the concept of a higher power into that mix? Because, I mean, I feel like that I, God is perfection. Right. And so, in a sense, like, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I do feel that sometimes we strive for that perfectionism because that's like, in our mind, what what's perfect to us is not necessarily perfect to God. Mm. So, if I think the spirituality piece comes in when you are operating in a path that's not your own, yeah, um, and recognizing that even if it may not look perfect to me, it's God's perfection, yeah, that matters. So. Again, it's all about what you believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I like that you add that. Yeah. You know, you're you're so open when we yeah. talk about these things, and, mm-hmm. and you keep it open for the people who are listening. And yeah. it, it, I think that's massively important, just from the standpoint of obviously you're in good company. I was raised Christian as well, and and hold a lot of those values, and I don't mm-hmm. I pick no bones about it. You yeah. know, and at the same time, you know, in the realms of helping and assisting people to find their set of morals and values and connect with that Mm -hmm. it has to be open because there's there's people who've had bad experiences and but Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean they can't find it and i think you're absolutely right right we we strive for perfection and and uh i always tell my clients it's like none of us are ever going to be saints i'm Mm -hmm. and i tell i'm certainly not going to be a saint because i'm i'm never going to stop saying the f word (laughs) you know it's just i I try but it's it's hard you know it's a struggle you know (laughs) (laughs) it's a different type of struggle yeah Yeah. Somewhere like otherwise the replacements don't always just fit the way it uh-huh. is. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's just the right word. Yeah, man. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But it's but it is. It's a pursuit and I, I think it's the right one. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I, f- I found that through pain and suffering, mm-hmm. you know, in my own ways and versions in life is like you know, I didn't want to pursue and strive for any more of the chaos that I was used to. Yeah. You know, I had to find something that was more calm and mm-hmm. peaceful. Uh, and, and so I gravitated to people who, who were embodying what that looked like. And I had never had that before. You know, I, I grew up yeah. in a really, you know, I, I love my family to death, but I, I grew up in a chaotic environment. My mom grew up in a trailer park. You know, my, my dad is from, you know, the Galveston, like Texas city area. Yeah. Um, you know, and my grandfather was a pretty abusive alcoholic. Mm-hmm. God rest his soul. He got recovery at the end of his life and, and lived a strong <laughs> AA program. But the chaos that ensued is what I was used to growing up on both sides of my my parents, you know, mm-hmm. family. And uh, I got to a point in my adulthood where I was like, you know, I'm striving for like a co- perfection in my accomplishments, feeling unwanted, unloved and alone, feeling worthless, feeling like all of that. If I was just perfect, I'd get everybody to love me the way I want mm-hmm. them to love me. And you know what? None of those pursuits ever mattered. Yeah. What, what mattered is I, I heard this story. Right. And it's uh, a young man walks into the ether and there's this big invisible wall. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of the wall is everything he he ever envisioned he wanted for his life. Peace, abundance, love, acceptance. Right. And he walks up and there's a door and he knocks on the door and the greeter opens and says, what's the password? And the the guy said, "I I don't know. He said, well, why don't you go ask your mentor, your sponsor, right? Your whoever's giving you guidance. Mm -hmm. So he goes back and he asks the guy who's giving him guidance. And he looks at him, he says, that's it, that's the password. And he says, yeah, go and try it. Mm -hmm. So he comes back to the door and he knocks and the greeter says, what's the password? And the young man says, I am nothing, Mm -hmm. I am no one. And the greeter says, come on in, the door is unlocked. Mm -hmm. And it's, when I found people like that, Mm -hmm. who it didn't matter to them what they were accomplishing, it didn't matter to them what I had accomplished, it didn't matter to them the status, it didn't matter how perfect I was. They accepted me for who I was and I accepted them for who they were. It was those moments that changed my life. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I that's an amazing example. Um, because I I feel like so much of perfection is about perception. Yeah. Um that that rhymed a little bit too. Yeah, I, didn't yeah. that. I didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, like perfection is so much about how we perceive a certain aesthetic, a certain look, a certain feeling like it's never it's never something that's really attainable mm. because when you get to the level that you think perfection is on it's never there yeah yeah <laughs> you, we're not designed to find what perfection truly is yeah we're just not 
Like, I just feel like we were created to discover what our purpose is. Mm. Not necessarily find perfection. Perfection may be in that purpose. Yeah. And, I mean, every we weren't promised that. We weren't promised perfection at all. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and someone put it to me like this. is like you also weren't promised that you were going to know when you fulfilled that purpose, so just keep going. Yeah. You know, there is no destination. Yeah. You know, the the journey is part of that purpose. And, you know, the, the most special thing that, that you were supposed to do, you might have already done. doesn't mean you won't do cool things in your life. doesn't mean you're not going to meet wonderful people and have a chance to do that over and over. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, is when we think of the way perfectionism has, has kind of infiltrated our society Mm -hmm. with those high standards and high expectations. It's the constant control. Yeah. Right. It's like there it's, I was talking with someone this morning in my my practice about, you know, it's like trying to force the outcomes. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to will myself to this thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, and and they were you, you know it's it's the subtle stuff and maybe you guys listening know people like this Gabe maybe you do too mm-hmm. is like they're trying to convince you they're happy and then they get to the <laughs> end of the story and it's like were you really happy because it yeah. sounded kind of miserable exactly you know? I, it's funny I was just watching uh, Modern Family <laughs> yeah <laughs> and one of the funny one of the things that I noticed in that show is that um, there was an episode with one of the I forgot I can't even remember the names of these mm-hmm. people but yeah. it was an interaction interaction between uh one of the wives on the show and her friend Mm. her friend came in town to visit or whatever and she painted this perfect picture of this perfect life she got the big uh, office job and has all of these different multiple lovers all over the world you know and then the wife is like oh i have a family like you should come by the house and the family's acting crazy yeah (laughs) they throwing stuff everywhere you got liquor bottles all over the place (laughs) like it's just a mess and I just found that so interesting because we like to put up these facades as if we're so perfect. This yeah. perfect world, like, and I think everybody is missing something that they mm. think they should have. Yeah. Um, when you get to higher levels, I notice so many people that feel empty, for lack of a better word. Like, yeah. I, I think they get to those levels, they've sacrificed all of this stuff, and they look around, and there's nobody there to share it with. Yeah. Um. And I think a lot of that I- idea of perfection comes from, like, our value system. Mm-hmm. Like, what what do you truly value in this yeah. life? Yeah. And and if that answer is money, mm-hmm. you know. It's never going to heal you. Yeah, you know, and we, we have studies on that. You know, it's like I, I always... Uh, because the best one that we have is the Harvard happiness study. It's like the longest empirical study we have on happiness and they've even adjusted it for inflation. Yeah. Have you ever heard of this study? I haven't. This is perfect. Then take a stab at what do you think the, the, uh, level of income, right? Is, Mm. uh, for the cutoff of the point in which any more money than that won't make you happy in America Mm. adjusted for inflation. What's the, what's the salary that's the peak of your happiness? the peak of happiness uh where if you made a dollar more it's not going to matter how happy you are hmm that's interesting it's hard for me to answer that because i don't necessarily operate with that yeah like money i i've always been i've been raised with the idea that money is not doesn't equate to happiness yeah um it may equate to a little bit of peace. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there are certain, uh, and I think even this number, it's like over yeah. time mm-hmm. you can cultivate a lot of peace, especially in a shared unit. Right. Um, but take, take a stab. Just, yeah. I'll yeah. just say, um, I'll say 200,000. Yeah. yeah. Well, not, you're not that far off. Yeah. I, you know, I've heard answers where it's like, Oh yeah. A million dollars. It's yeah. like the, the yearly salary of the cutoff for happiness is $80,000 adjusted for inflation. So at the point you make $80,000, you know, let's say you're making $40,000 and you get a raise, you're yeah. going to be pretty you're going to be pretty happy, yeah, right? True. You know, but once you get to the point of $80,000 a year, mm-hmm. any raises past that are great, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, "Hey, look, you know, stack your money, mm-hmm. get your wealth, do do your thing, but past that point, it's not going to impact on any measures your mm-hmm. happiness," yeah. right? And $80,000 if you're, you know, dedicated to a craft, reasonably educated, put your time in, you're going to get to that point in, in our society. Um, 
if you're dedicated, mm-hmm. right? And there's always going to be the percentages of society who are, you know, like we talked about last week, who are facing things that they can't mm-hmm. get out from under or who, who aren't going to put the work in at all, you right. know? Um, but the vast percentages of like gentlemen like you and I who are out there trying, it's like we're, we're going to get to that point and beyond because we're trying, Absolutely. right? And so, you know, the and uh, most of the listeners, right. Who are going to listen to something like this or in that camp. And so yeah. it's important to re- remember, I think if you guys are listening to this is that money, you know, it can have a bearing on happiness up to a certain point, but there's also a lot of other indicators that show if you don't reach that mark, that there's like 50 or 60 other indicators that'll make you more happy, mm-hmm. even if you're not making $80,000 a year. And yeah. a lot of those get, especially in our society, a lot of those get ignored. Mm-hmm. You know, it's true. I think, America, the consumerism and the capitalism of America has made us devalue some of the like basic things like mm-hmm. just family, love, all of those little things that we see as little that are really huge. Like, yeah. um, just because of the fact that like we're so get up, I got to go get it. Mm-hmm. I got to go find a way to go get it. Like, yeah. And yes, we have needs and necessities, but at the same time, like anything beyond the necessities, like is excess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's a privilege. It's a privilege. Yeah. It's a privilege and a blessing. Yeah. And so you just have to re- recognize it as such, and mm-hmm. just understand that this could all be gone mm-hmm. <laughs> in yeah. an instant. Yeah. Like I've heard so many stories like that. People have it all and then lose it all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so again, like happiness can't be in something that's of this earth. Yeah. Yeah. In all honesty, nothing monetary, nothing physical. Yeah, yeah. You know, some of the major ones on, like, even the scales for the, the Harvard study are things like prayer and meditation. Yeah. The, some that make me laugh in those realms of studies on happiness are, like, you know, when, when people joke with each other when uh, when you've been inside too long, like, hey, you need to go touch some grass. Yeah. It's like those are on happiness scales. Get yeah. outside and touch grass. You know? <laughs> Another one is growing your own food. Like, Mm -hmm. think about how many Americans actually grow their own food. It's like 1%. Yeah, it's it's a, yeah, you know, I have a friend that, uh, from my master's program, she's a homesteader with her husband, and Mm -hmm. when they post stuff, it's like, yeah, they're a little goofy, you know, but they're so happy, you know, and they're just good people, they're out, you know, making their own food and Mm -hmm. living off the land to the best of their ability. It's, you know, she even acknowledges, right, it's pretty impossible to do that 100% in our society, which is it's mind blowing to think like on one hand, man, we've come so far. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, it's like, man, we're getting really out of touch with things that are are probably going to come back and then nobody's going to know what to do. Because that's the thing too. I was, again, I've watched a lot of shows and movies Mm -hmm. and stuff. I was watching uh, the leave, leave the world behind film on Netflix. And it just kind of put in perspective. I was like, all right, so we're not prepared for nothing. No. If they shut no. everything down, these phones, the Wi Fi, the Wi Fi would kill everybody. Oh, in a day. Like, <laughs> dude, people will go ballistic. You, you, yeah. Did we talk about this when, uh, what was it, like a year or two ago, Instagram went down for yeah, like almost I, 24 hours and people were losing <laughs> their minds, dude? <laughs> I, yeah. I just I think about it and I'm I'm just so glad now Wi-Fi I can't even lie I would be one of the people too because mm-hmm. I work from home yeah so I can't work I can't watch yeah. no TV no more I can't there's nothing that you could do yeah. so Wi-Fi would be something that would be serious mm-hmm. like because yeah. that's gonna affect jobs it's gonna affect a lot of different things oh yeah um but I remember when AT and T had that outage and I have AT and T and I was chilling. I was like, oh, this is peaceful. My phone not ringing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. I, I'm not one of those people that just relies on my phone constantly. But yeah, um, I know a lot of people that are, and mm-hmm. it would be bad. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they – um, God, I wish I could remember the name of the company, but they do simulations on, like, end-of-the-world scenarios. Yeah. And, you know, uh, one of them is, is how long would it take for society to collapse if mm-hmm. Internet was gone? Like yeah. just gone, not coming back. And it's mm. something like just over 24 hours that wars would break out. And uh, within countries, mm. you know, like people would start staking off lands. And, uh, you know, I remember, you know, I, I think about it in the standpoint of like a couple of years ago, um, my power went out when I was living in California. 
and I'm a pretty reasonable dude. Yeah. You know, like I, I try not to get too worked up over things at this point in my life. Now there were times when I used <laughs> to, sure. you know, um, <laughs> but, but even with all of my like coping strategies, it took me like a, a good five minutes to not be pissed off. Yeah. You know? And you know, it's like, I, I could imagine there are people out there who, they don't work on their mental health. They, they, they are not working on being reasonable with people. And if they lost access to the things that gave them instant gratification, mm -hmm. they'd be looking for the next person to cross them to take them out. I bet. I, yeah. I bet. Like, I'll just take your shit. Absolutely. You know? Like, it's, we're in a scary time. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it makes me want to, like, just pull out a map just to make sure I could still do it. Yeah. <laughs> like, you yeah. know, it's just like little stuff like that. Uh -huh. Like, I don't know. It's, it's scary. Yeah. Well, you, you and I grew up in a generation too, where, um, it's hard to remember times without the internet. Right. Mm -hmm. But we probably are also from a time where we can distinctly remember our parents pulling out those maps. So yeah. almanacs remember yeah. where you have to like unfold them. <laughs> and I, I bet you there's people that will come across a video like this and hear the word almanac and they won't even know what that is. Nah. You know, which, you know, we we're living in a day and age where like generations don't even know what like a cassette is. Yeah. You know, it's, and wild. it's crazy. Too. I remember I used to spend my summers at my grandma's house. Right. And yeah. so they used to have a room with encyclopedias like the whole yeah. encyclopedia collection from a to z yeah and like it was just it was fascinating to me i used to go in there and just like pick up like one of the books and just look through it yeah. um and it's so many people that now that have never seen that yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's it's fascinating to me yeah how far yeah. we've come that's a that's an interesting one you know encyclopedias because you you'd never mm -hmm. think like um Growing up, if someone would have told you that libraries would be like, you know, inconsequential, you'd be like, what? You know, books? Yeah. Like, yeah, I can just yeah. listen to the book. What? Yeah. <laughs> but that's the world we live in, man. It's, it's like you you want to publish a book these days. It's like, well, you, you better also, uh, you know, let out the audio version because that's how most of the readers are going to read your book. Yeah. You know, they don't even read anymore. They listen. Mm -hmm. It's wild. And I mean, it's a gift and a curse. I just feel like. Even with um, just cursive, I remember they don't even teach cursive in school. Yeah. Like my niece told me that <laughs> not too long ago. Yeah. She's like, "Yeah, we're we're not learning cursive." Yeah, I was like, "Wow, I guess they're not using it." Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, have you seen like they don't even um, they don't do basic arithmetic the way we used to do it? You know, like yeah, you know how weird. like uh, when we were kids, did you still have the dot system? Mm -hmm. They use like shapes now. It's like weird, dude. That's like crazy. one of my clients who's a parent, she was telling me like they mm -hmm. use like these shapes and stuff to like count up to like four and five. And I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> like my I, I can't even fathom. But like apparently these kids are learning now like. Um, they they used to like joke about it in movies like Rain Man, you know, mm -hmm. but like that's how they're teaching kids now is like to envision the numbers. And like we can all do that, I think, with base, basic arithmetic yeah. up to a certain point, And some people can do it way out. But that's mm -hmm. how they're teaching kids now. It's crazy. That's scary. I, I mean, I don't have kids right now, but that's scary to think about. Well, yeah, <laughs> you, you know what her her fear was is that, yeah. um, you know, as that progresses, she's not going to be able to help her kid with anything arithmetic or, or the way that their their mm -hmm. kids are being taught in schools. And, you know, I, I know for certain, like, yeah. I, first of all, I already wasn't a good student when it came to math, you know, even <laughs> in the old I, ways. <laughs> I feel algebra, uh, too. So I yeah. had to retake that my senior year. <laughs> that was a whole thing. But yeah. yeah, math was never my subject. Yeah. <laughs> but I just think about it, too, because I remember back when I was in school, like my parents used to say that that math was even different when they would mm -hmm. try to help me with it. So yeah. it's, it's just fascinating how things change. Like mm -hmm. the, the way that they were doing math, they were doing like actual timetables mm -hmm. and <laughs> yeah. like having to count on their hand. Like it was just different. Whatever they was doing was different from what we was doing. So yeah. Um, yeah. it's wild. It's yeah. Really wild. And you know, I don't know how much that, is a is is a bad thing as much as like everything is changing yeah which i think also relates to a conversation about perfectionism if you're trying to be perfect in a world that's always changing mm. you're never going to keep up right you know and uh goalposts is always going to move yeah yeah you know that's why um you know, when you, when you had walked in and Sammy and I were, t Sammy and I were talking about like, just, you know, getting into stuff like this and just going for it, just talking, yeah. turn on the camera, turn on the microphone and start putting stuff out. It's like, yeah. 
that if you're if if you're waiting to like do the things you want to do in your life, mm -hmm. um, I, I talk a lot with my clients about this. Is like um, stop making all these arbitrary goals, you know, mm -hmm. all the way down to the nitty gritty. Because you heard someone on YouTube tell you that goal setting is the way to go. It's mm -hmm. like, look, goals are good to know the direction you want to go. Right. But one of the ways I think I've always tried to think about it. And I've heard wise people tell me is like. You, you look up and you see a shining light toward the direction you want to go. So you head in that direction, but then as you're in the present on the path, you see like, oh, actually, I kind of like this direction better, mm -hmm. right? And so you start heading there, and then all of a sudden you're going here. You can't even see the light initially that you started, mm -hmm. but you see a better direction. Yeah. You know, and that was never going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, if you would have asked me when I was 14 years old, you know, I would have had some grandiose, beautiful picture of like being a professional baseball player. Yeah. You know, it's a great dream. I, right. But only 750 people in the world do that. Yeah. And, you know, I was good enough to play in college. Mm -hmm. Right. But uh, I was better off as a therapist. Yeah. You know, a lot less heartbreak. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I mean, like. To that point, like, if you would have asked me at 14, I would have been the next Deion Sanders. Like, sure. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, I had dreams of playing football mm -hmm. or basketball, one of the sports. Like, I was going to be an athlete in some capacity. Yeah. But that's not the direction that I was taking. Yeah. You know, and you don't realize it when you're in those, in that position. You think that, yeah, this this is where I want to go. This is where I'm going to go. And mm -hmm. if I don't go this way, I don't have no other options. Yeah. <laughs> but in actuality, like, you have – so many other options. Yeah. Like, you could do anything that you really want that you set your mind to. So, yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting how we try to control things with goals because I really think that's really, that's what it is. It, it is. It, I, I think that's a good call out, right? Mm -hmm. Because we also, you know, if we look at the realm of mental health, we live in a day and age where um, most of the attention in the realms of well being goes to like life coaching and things like that, which, I, you know, I'm not going to say like, get rid of life coaching. Yeah. What I am going to say is like, if you really want to work on the depth of your psyche and your well being, mm -hmm. life coach isn't going to get you there. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, some of them may, you know, I mean, I know life coaches in my life who have master's level educations and they just mm -hmm. didn't become a clinician maybe because they had kids and didn't want to go back and do the clinical hours or, or whatever. I'm not saying that life coaches don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. What I will say is that life coaches who try to pump you full of like the sales tactics and the goal setting and all that kind of stuff, you're better off saving your money because it's yeah. going to get you caught in the loop of, you know, that, that consumer mindset that the only way that you're going to get ahead is if you sell like them. Yeah. And I was talking with, again, another client earlier this week who, uh, you know, he is a life coach. Um, mm -hmm. but what he leans on a lot more and why he has success with it is his experience in taking care of his mental health over 40 years, mm -hmm. you know, and people gravitate to him. And I remember when he first came to me, he was trying to like sell these courses and do all this stuff. And I was like, brother, I, I think yeah. people are going to gravitate to you because you take care of yourself and you should tell that story. And wouldn't you know it, that was a much better route for him. Yeah. You know, I believe that. And yeah. you know, I, I realized that some of the greatest entrepreneurs we've ever seen were the biggest mm -hmm. risk takers. Yeah. They weren't relying on perfection. They were okay with failing. Yeah. Um, and I think we, a lot of us have million dollar dreams with middle class mentality. <laughs> <Yeah>. And <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Like it's, yeah. yeah, you can achieve, and I'm using money as an example because it's obviously we already talked about <laughs> what money is not the end all be all, but yeah. I'm using it as an example to say that like, you have to be willing to take risk in life and do something different in order for you to reach some of those heights that we aspire to have reach. Yeah. Um, and even when you get there, it's, it's may or may not look how you thought it was going to look, yeah. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I completely agree with that. And, mm -hmm. and you know, one of the ways I relate to it is like, there was a real shift in my life where in my early twenties, you know, and I'm sure people who know me who are listening to this, remember like when the young me I wanted after baseball, it was, I want to be a public speaker and I want to make millions of dollars and I want to leave some kind of impact. And, and it was that it was all that all the time. And, you know, I've had realms of success in those things. It's, it's why I do this. I, I enjoy speaking. And, you know, one of the places I came to is number one, I enjoy hearing myself talk way too, way too much. I need, I need to come off that. Right. <laughs> that, that was a journey to like break down my ego, you know, because early in my early years, um, 
a lot of my speaking was because I felt like I had the answers Mm -hmm. and uh, a big transition for me was, you know, I'm not, I'm no longer trying to speak to people because I know I have some kind of answer I'm speaking to people, um, just about my experience, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's what good people have done for me. And I I seem to have some kind of gift in, in sharing information that people relate to. And so Mm -hmm. instead of trying to, to get some kind of clout, I'm going to do it to just share experience. Mm -hmm. Whoever listens, listens, whoever doesn't, doesn't. But the interesting thing is what I realized is I wasn't trying to make money anymore. I wasn't trying to get clout anymore. What mattered at a certain point were the opportunities to be of service Mm. to somebody and in the willingness and the lengths that I was, that I was willing to go to because I knew it was going to help me too. that, that started to define success for me in my life. And and wouldn't you know it, man, it's like once I started to do that without a a desire for some kind of payoff in society, Mm -hmm. but just truly being of service to someone who needed support in the moment, that's when anything I ever wanted in my life started to piece together, you know? Yeah, I believe that. I definitely believe that. I, I think that's what it takes though. Yeah. It has to be something bigger than you. Yeah. (laughs) In order for it, for it to be something that you get up and do every single day. Yeah. Um, it has to fulfill you mm-hmm. in a sense. And, you know, going back to the perfection piece of it, I feel like a lot of the our idea of fulfillment comes from a perfect lifestyle or aesthetic yeah. that we see on a daily basis. Um, and honestly, I mean, there's more value in what you're doing. Mm. Like because it aligns with you and your path and your purpose, so yeah. um, that's the biggest thing is finding what aligns with your purpose. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You'll be much happier that way. Absolutely. You don't have to force it when it just clicks. Yeah. You know, and and beyond happiness, and this is this is something to kind of tie in towards the end of this conversation is you find peace in those realms. Mm-hmm. You know, and and. And that's not just me speaking from my experience. That's other good people who've shown me that directly, that peace was actually what we were looking for. Yeah. You know, and uh, happiness is overrated. Yeah. Yeah. More money, more problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they made yeah. the song for a reason. That's right. That's right. See who made this song. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, God bless Seal, man. <laughs> right. well, I'd rather have peace any day, Absolutely. you know, and um, and in that way, when when uh, financial stability comes wealth or whatever you know whatever blessings come to those who are listening to Gabe and I it's like with peace we stand a better chance of knowing what to do with it yeah and absolutely. Uh, that's that's a worthwhile pursuit in my opinion I agree yeah so I think we're gonna wrap up there guys we appreciate you checking in do you have any last words you want to share Gabe yeah just don't chase perfection chase purpose yeah chase purpose that's it <laughs> yeah, I like it. That's a beautiful place to end. Absolutely. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you next week's episode, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, Breaking the Cycle. Love you guys. Bye.